Hello! Welcome to Back to Philosophical Inquiry, special coronavirus edition. And if you, um, you say to me, Kovach, where are you now? Well, I'll answer that question in a moment. Uh, for now, let me clarify. I got an email from someone. I want to clarify something I said the other day. Uh, I had said the other day that, um, you know, most of you uh, should be very safe from uh, the coronavirus. It's, it's not... Uh, not being very hard on people your age. But one of you sent me an email asking, well, can you know you can still be contagious to others? And that's right. Uh, I encourage you all to practice social distancing, avoid any kind of a, anything that puts other people at risk, uh, cough in your mouth, do all that smart stuff, please. Uh, you can even make it a game. See, how much can you do? How much can you do to practice social distancing, to be in isolation? do some of the self-quarantine stuff. I myself am doing this right now, so where am I? I'm actually in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, I had to I had to leave California, that's a long story. Uh, so I flew out of there very quickly from LAX on Wednesday night. And um, LAX, of course, as you know, is one of the, the uh, high uh, hot, hot spot contamination places right now. So there's a higher chance that I picked up the virus going through there. So I'm now at my mother's house in Fort Myers, Florida, and I have the first thing I told my mother I'm doing is I'm going into self-quarantine for 14 days. So I'm in my room here. I'm leaving, you know, I leave to, to use the bathroom. I leave a couple of times a day to get a little bit of food. I have, I have just one plate. I, I brought up, you know, I'm using, trying to touch as few things as possible. Uh, when I leave here, I make sure I can get straight from here to the kitchen and back without being within six feet of my mother or anybody else. And so you should be doing as much of the same as possible, especially if you've gone through a high-risk place. Make it a game and look at it as an opportunity to, to do things that you're normally too busy to do. I know you're still busy with classes and things like that, but I brought some books with me that I've been meaning to read for a while. Uh, I brought some... Uh, writing projects with me that I haven't had time to work on otherwise. I I wish I had time to take up a, a study of uh, some chess openings I've been meaning to learn. And by meaning to learn, I mean for like the past seven years. So, you know, that, uh, that crazy guitar that you bought on a whim last year, now's your chance to sit down, look at some YouTube videos, and figure out how to play all those chords. Or that... Uh, that exotic language you've been wanting to learn, now's your chance. Learn how to write poetry. Do a study of one of your favorite um, authors, or Shakespeare, you know. You can stream all kinds of great stuff online. Choose a Shakespeare play. My favorite to do this with is Hamlet. And see how many different versions you can stream and start comparing them like that. And study philosophy. Hi, here we're, we're here to study philosophy. Uh, we're going to be looking today at the last, uh, the last of the uh, philosophers that we study in this course. You know, we did a lot of time with Socrates and Plato, a little bit of Aristotle, some time with Aquinas. Last time we talked about Descartes for a bit. I'm going to culminate your study of the history of philosophy in the year 1776, because that is the year that David Hume died. That's David Hume, H-U-M-E. Uh, I didn't give you any reading by Hume for today. I figured we can just talk about him. He's a kind of complicated philosopher at first, but really shocking when you find out what he says. Who is David Hume, and why is he important? Hume is one of history's most radical... Here's a big philosophy word. Here it comes. Hume is one of the history of philosophy's most radical empiricists. I don't have a board to write on today. You can you can figure out how to spell empiricist. E-M-P-I-R-I-C-I-S-T. It's really hard to spell things out loud. It'd be really terrible at spelling bees, I think. He's an empiricist, and his empiricism leads him to a very radical skepticism. Skepticism. Let's see why. David Hume believed we basically have a couple of things that happen in our minds. Like two things that ever go on in our minds, he thought. He thought we have impressions. An impression is when something impresses itself upon my mind by way of one of the five senses. I touch a hot stove, 
I now have an impression of heat. I see a kitty cat, and I now have an impression of the outline, the image of that cuddly, furry, meowing monster. So I have impressions. That's the first kind of mental phenomenon. Then when I have enough mental impressions, and enough mental impressions that resemble each other, and even impressions of the same things, I get to form an idea. I have an idea of kitty cat. Not this or that kitty cat. I can just have an idea of kitty cat in general. I can have an idea of heat in general. You know, you can, I think you can do this. I think you can imagine, you know, you've been, you've touched a hot stove and, and that hurt. You can imagine it being even hotter. Why? Because you've had an impression, now you have an idea. And with ideas, with ideas, you can play with them a bit. You can, you can toy with them, you can modify them. You can modify them. That's just water, by the way. I'm trying to stay hydrated here in Florida. It's, um, I, I, I don't, I've never liked the weather in Florida. I really have to drink more water here. <coughs> with, once you have an idea, you can modify it. You can play with it. And you can do it because you've had other impressions, right? You can modify your idea of heat because you've had impressions of things that fall along a spectrum. Something more or less bright, something more or less cold. You can imagine more or less heat. So Hume says, you can have an idea of a golden mountain. Are there any golden mountains? No, there aren't. But you can have an idea of one. You can picture one. Why? You can picture a golden mountain because you've had impressions of the color gold. And you've had impressions of mountains upon you. You've seen mountains. Or you've at least had things described to you. But they always get described to you in terms of other things you've had impressions and ideas of. So, I have an impression of I'm sorry, I have an idea of a dragon. Where did I get my idea of a dragon from? Well, I've had impressions of things like reptiles, flying animals, fire breathing. I can, I can, I can, fire breathing, even that, that's a combination of two simpler impressions. Breathing, I really shouldn't do that except I'm in self-quarantine. And fire, I've had an impression of fire. So now I, I put all those images together and I get an idea of a dragon. Okay, big deal so far, right? I mean, if that's all Hume had said, I mean, you could have figured that out. I mean, especially if you're in self-quarantine. You know, that for two days, you get so wrapped up in your mind and your own thoughts, and he's like, oh, I guess I have impressions and ideas. Yeah, that's not what makes Hume famous. What makes Hume famous and important is where he goes next with it. He says, okay, everything we can legitimately think about should be traceable traceable back to an idea, and every idea should be traceable back to an impression. He says, if you can't trace what you're thinking about back to some impression, just stop thinking about it. And then he says, here's something I bet you can't do it with. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. We talk about cause and effect all the time. Well, where did you get the idea of cause? You've never seen cause. You've never seen cause. You've seen things happen one after another. You've seen things happen one after another, perhaps with regularity. But you've never seen cause. And, says Hume, your way of thinking about the world, your whole way of thinking about the world, depends on thinking about cause and effect. So Hume's an empiricist, right? What's that mean? He believes only... Empiricists are people who believe they put a strong emphasis on things that can be verified by the five senses. But here's something you have never had a sense perception of, cause and effect. You've seen this billiard ball moving until it hits this billiard ball, then you've seen this billiard ball moving. Did you see cause and effect? No! Again, let's examine it closely. You've seen this billiard ball moving, 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 stop. This billiard ball moving, 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 moving. 
You've seen it happen over and over again. So what, says Hume. So what? And you say, oh, so now I know how it'll happen in the future? No way! No what? How would you know it's going to happen that way in the future? Maybe next time you'll see moving, 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 and then this one turns into a radio and flies away. Prove that's never going to happen. You can't prove that's never going to happen. I don't think so. Why not? Here's the mantra. Here's the mantra from Hume. You cannot prove the future will be like the past. I'll say it again. You cannot prove that the future will be like the past. You've seen it 10 million times before, the billiard ball moving. You can't prove that it's going to happen in the future just because it happened in the past. Just because it happened a million times in the past. Just because it happened a billion times in the past. Where is the premise that says it'll be like that in the future? There's no... You can't just invent a premise like that. The future has to be like the past. Who says the future has to be like the past? If you can give me an argument based on Hume's principles that the future will be like the past, hey, you don't put it in the com box. I won't even bother making you turn in a final paper or a final video. I'll just give you an A, and I'll send an email to every professor in my department saying, give this person an A for all the classes in the major, because you can't do it. What's the argument that the future will be like the past? There isn't one. Again, all you know is what you've seen, what you've perceived with your senses in the past. I've had this sensation in my life. I've had a sensation right here in my... Oh, you say I'm not dressed as professional today. That's right, I'm wearing my Jethro Tull's Aqualung shirt. It's the only time you're ever going to see me lecture in this one. Okay. I <laughs> It's really embarrassing. I got to Florida... And I discovered I have packed my suitcase extremely embarrassingly. The, the clothes I brought with me make, like, no sense. I've got, like, a pair of jeans, three dress shirts, four ties, and my Aqualung shirt. I just threw stuff... I was more concerned with getting the books that I wanted, apparently. Where was I talking about? Oh, yeah, the future being like the past. Again, you've got your senses, and you've got what you've perceived before. You've perceived this feeling in your stomach. I've perceived the feeling in my stomach anyway. I can't talk about what you've perceived. Notice here, this is how skeptical Hume is. I can't even talk about what you've perceived. How would I know what you've perceived? All I know is what I've perceived. And I have perceived a feeling in my stomach. It's uncomfortable. And then I've perceived myself putting a burrito into my mouth. And then I perceived that feeling going away. And you say to me, well, yeah, burritos make that feeling go away. How would you know? How would you know that a, that burrito had anything to do with it? You say, well, it's happened millions of times. So? Could just be pure coincidence. This is Hume's point. It could be that everything has happened with regularity. And it's been pure coincidence. Pure coincidence. It could even be the fact that I perceived you uttering similar sounds as the sounds that I utter with my mouth. That could be pure coincidence. My inference, that inference I make that, oh, you must have a mind like I do and ideas like I do. Did I, did, I'm sorry, did I ever see your ideas? I don't think so. See, this is how radical Hume is. Hume says, prove to me, prove to me that you have a mind that has ideas like I do. And show me your idea. See, I've got an idea of a kitty cat. I'm thinking of the idea of kitty cat itself. Can you see my idea of kitty cat? No, no. No, no. You can't see other people's ideas. You can't even really see your own ideas. You can just have your own ideas. So, you cannot prove the future will be like the past. You cannot prove there's such a thing as cause and effect. And if that's right... You know what we lose? You know what's gone? Off the board. No more. Stay quiet forever and ever again. The whole thing that I've been calling natural theology, or which Aquinas calls, uh, what Aquinas calls 
of natural theology or philosophical theology, the whole philosophy of religion now falls apart. Because in the classical theist tradition, remember I told you about classical theism? Implicit in that whole tradition is the notion of cause. I can say, I can say, I, it seems, uh, classical theist says, look, it just makes sense to say, why Mr. Whiskers? Why cats? Why animals? And to give an account. But for Hume, these why questions, and the whole notion of giving an account, a causal account, it's nonsense. What, did I, what, what was the mantra I gave you for Aquinas? For Aquinas, I said, the statement God exists means what? It means there's features of the universe which ought to be causally accounted for by other And there's where Hume punches you in the face. Did you say, did you say causal account? Because I don't know what that means. A causal account, this is what Hume says. I've never seen a causal account. I've never tasted a causal account. I've never heard causal account. I've never touched causal account. I can't even smell causal account. All I can smell is smoke. And every time I've smelled smoke, shortly after, it gets warmer. And so you say to me, well, isn't that proof that fire causes smoke? No, why is it? Why is it? All I know is that some number of times, one impression, the sense impression of smell, was followed by another impression, that of seeing heat, but I've never had an impression of cause and effect. The future could be totally different. Maybe someday I'll smell smoke and never see fire again. Prove to me I won't. You can't. You can't. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you anything you want if you can. Trust me. Trust me. I'm not just making this up here. I'm deeply troubled by Hume. I am, I, I, I mean, I go to conferences, I present things on philosophy of religion, and invariably there will be somebody in the room who will raise his hand, or her hand, and say, sorry pal, I'm a Humean. And I just, oh. I don't know what to say to the Humean philosophers. We're just, we're at a crossroads. I mean, we've made some, we've figured out some other areas of, you can take philosophy of religion with me, and figure out where the the further disagreements lie but right now I think I think Hume is the biggest threat to classical theism now here's my saving ace in the hole so they say if Hume's right if Hume is right what else have we lost what else do we lose if Hume is right go and pause the tape write it down see if you can figure it out Kovacs, did you just say tape? Did you just call the YouTube video a tape? Is this 1994? What would have happened if all these classes went online in 94? Nothing. Thanks to YouTube and not tape, we're still having class. Pause the video. See what else we lose if we say Hume is right. You know what else we lose? We lose science. Because some of you were thinking that, weren't you? Some of you were thinking, well, scientists know that when you jump off a building, you fall at a certain rate to the ground. Oh, and how do they know that? How do they? They know that because they've had a sense impression that X number of times in the past, something gets dropped and falls and falls at a certain accelerative rate. And then they say, let's just help ourselves to the following premise. Premise. The future will be like the past. But that's the very thing Hume's saying you can't prove. So we lose science. We lose even more, actually. We lose our ability to, to operate if we want to be strict. Even Hume admits this. Hume says, you should believe me, but act otherwise. Believe me that you don't know what the future is going to be like the past. But please, says Hume, don't walk off the top of a building. Don't throw yourself into a fire. When you feel that pain in your stomach, eat a burrito? Even Hume admits you can't actually live the way his own theory prescribes. Nevertheless, Hume does issue a stark challenge to philosophers and to scientists. 
start with some basic common sense principles. Like, all of your ideas start in the senses and come from impressions. Any idea that you can't trace back to your impression should be jettisoned. You've never had an impression of cause and effect, therefore you should jettison it. Valid argument. Where does it go wrong? Wait, very hard to say. Very Valid. So now we have to figure out which premises aren't sound. That's not easy to do. I might ask you to do it someday. I'm just the kind of person who would. But for the time being, you should know that I've put a great deal of emphasis on classical theism. I think classical theism, especially as we find it in Aquinas, has a lot to offer. But, yeah, there's a problem. There is one little problem. Okay, we have one more lecture on the philosophy of religion. I want to talk about the problem of evil, uh, which we're getting closer and closer to really having to think about. I uh, hope you're all well. Leave some comments down there in the comment box. Um, you should be getting uh, stuff from me in the near future about how we're going to wrap up the end of the semester, what to do about your final projects and papers and all that. Uh, I'm recording this on Friday, March the 20th, so I didn't have any kind of office hours today because uh, email from the dean said classes are still off right now. There's still no classes. As of 6 p.m. last night, if you even try to get on LMU's campus, they have security man-eating tigers that are devouring people who dare to step foot on campus. Oh, except for University Hall where you can still pick up mail. Uh, okay, I really do hope you're all doing well. I know different people are handling this with different levels of anxiety. Um, this is a weird thing, but we'll be okay. See you soon.